Well, with your copy of God's Word in hand, and I pray that you do have the scriptures before you so that you can see as we read, as we explain the text, please turn with me to the fourth chapter of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. And as you're turning there, let me review the the inspired goal in verses 1 through 16. As we have stressed before that verses 1 through 6, although we're breaking it down into smaller components, it is it is one sentence in the original Greek text. And it is a, a general uh, overall call uh, to unity, to unity. And this unity is with the triune God, the eternal pre-existing triune God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And in this text, they will be, as we see in verse 4, we'll see in verses 4 through 6, the supreme example of unity for the church. And because we live in union with Christ, unity is a gift from God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we examine this body of Scripture, we will recognize that we are maintaining unity that has been given to us by God through the Holy Spirit. And we can see already, and we have seen, beloved, that to unite as believers, we need the doctrine or the instruction from the Word of God. When you examine verse 1, verse 1 will transition us toward this duty after having firmly set the doctrine that it is essential for our lives that the doctrine undergirds and informs our unity. So you and I can never obey God without the teaching that we have received in verses in chapters 1 through 3, and we cannot live united without the doctrines that we have seen in chapters 1 through 3. Now, verses 7 through 9, are, it's an, they're an introduction to the unity of the church, but also the diversity of, of gifts given to us by the Spirit of God. And then verses 11 through 16, it, it sets out before us or lays out before us God's plan or the goal uh, for the use of those gifts. You can see in verse 13 of chapter 4, there is this combined truth of the unity until we all attain to the unity of the faith. You look at verse 5 of chapter 4, you will see that there's one Lord, one faith. So these are all interrelated. And we will examine this, this teaching of this one faith because it is another critical component to the church's life together. Because this faith, we will know, is not only what we believe when it comes to hearing the gospel, but it has to do with the content of our faith, the doctrines themselves. And then concluding in verse 16, you you recognize that in this overall plan, it is so that the body may grow together, that we may be even more united as, as it grows and it builds itself up in love. And so you see the first 16 verses explains how we walk in unity and how we will grow together in this unity. We must always be reminded, dear beloved, that unity is exclusively something that we all receive from the Lord Jesus Christ and on the basis of our union with him. This unity, it is is not external to us, it is given to us by God in Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. And so, by virtue of that truth, we all share in this union together with the Father in Christ and the Holy Spirit. I do want to say something very important as we look at this and as we navigate through this passage of Scripture. 
that as we mature in our knowledge of this truth and our obedience to this truth, the unity becomes more cohesive. It is richer. It is more recognizable. And that is why the appeal is made in verse 1, encouraging us, also appealing us to let our life fit the doctrine. Because a worthy walk, when you walk in a manner worthy of the calling, is to submit your ways, your life, to match the truth that God has revealed to you from the Scripture. The true walk of a Christian is to have a, an accurate fit between the doctrine and the duty. And we know the Word of God is not what changes. It's the Word of God that changes us. In this reality of the truth of God's Word in our lives, it is the Word of God that fits us to the doctrine. Therefore, we're always in the process of being changed, transformed, by the Word of God and through the life-giving Spirit of God. There's also one more very important truth that the church must hold fast to. We need to see the big picture at all times. That as we follow these ordained instructions from the Word of God, that we live as a display to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places just how God unites and will unite the cosmos through His Son. How He will bring the entirety of creation in full and final submission to His Son is seen in the life of the church. So, beloved, the life of the church, that is you and I as believers, our life in these last days is nothing short of a glorious responsibility to live as a display to the world of God's glorious grace to reconcile us as rebellious sinners unto himself. And if he can reconcile those who are formerly dead in their trespasses and sins, those who once lived under the power and the rule of Satan, he can and will one day bring all creation to its final and eternal state of rest and peace. Now, last week, we began looking at verses 2 and 3 and seeing how God is imparting disciplines, disciplines that will encourage your passion for genuine unity. I want to read those verses before we move on, verses 1 through 6 of Ephesians 4 reads as follows, I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the Word of God to us. Disciplines that will encourage your passion for genuine unity. And last week, we, we looked at the first discipline, and the first discipline was to apply humility and gentleness. Apply humility and gentleness. And from, from that, we know that to apply humility is to recall God's mercy. It's to recall God's mercy. And then to apply gentleness is to accept God's dealings. But when you accept God's dealings or whatever God is doing in your life within the local church or even in the world, you do so with, with patience with a patient disposition that is slow to anger. But now we move on to our second discipline, and it is at the end of verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, and it, it says bearing. Bearing with one another in love. So this second discipline is to apply patience and a zeal for unity. 
apply patience and a zeal for unity. And specifically on this patience, dear saints, exercise patience toward difficult believers. Exercise patience toward difficult believers. Because this bearing up here, it gives evidence of a life that lives in harmony with the truth. And that is true because you are doing this for the sake of Christ, for the glory of Christ, for the name of Christ, for the honor of Christ. And so your bearing up is always in relationship to Christ, not to the circumstance, not to the other party, not to the other believer. You're bearing up with them because of Christ. I do also want you to recognize that bearing up is not necessarily an act of give and take directly. In other words, I'm doing something directly for you. Now you owe me a favor in return. That's not how it works. It is more of an act of giving and receiving. But it is not concerned with the person who gives or receives. It's more concerned in giving. Because it knows that as we submit to the truth and the Word of God, there will always be the reception. Someone will always give in return. And in this epistle, you have the first of several one another's that we should be doing one toward another. It's a constant practice of the Christian. Bearing up with you as you bear up with me and you bear up with others. There's also another very important element to bearing up, and it is that we are bearing up equally with each other. Our society is always emphasizing social equality. But let me tell you, the equality that is hard to gain, it is theological equality. To equally bear up with each other, oh, it is so much easier to bear up with a difficult saint. Or easier to bear up with a saint that is not as difficult. But it is hard to bear up with the difficult saint. But you are applying this equality of affection to another believer without considering how hard they make it on you. So you're more concerned about the task than the person. You're more concerned about the truth than the other party. So you're bearing up, applying the same act of bearing up to each other without exception. Let me give you another weighty truth from this as to why we pray, asking God to enable us to hear, to receive, and to obey because this comes from him. And I know we are grateful to God for his sacrifice on the cross for Jesus Christ for when we sin against each other. But beloved, our weakness and our struggles are not excuses for not obeying. We are commanded to do this in the power and the presence of the Spirit of God who not only saves us with the same power, but equips us to obey with the same power. I'm grateful for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that saves me, but also enables me to obey. Bearing up here, my dear saints, is, as one lexical aide says so well, it is patience under pressure. Patience under pressure. Now, that pressure can be from several sources. We may not always respond well when we're tired, so that may be a pressure, all its own exhaustion. And we love to use tiredness as, as if it's one of the virtues that excuses us, from, excuses us from acting out on our sinful impulses. But no, this is patience under pressure. The pressure may also be just 
the knack for a fellow believer knowing somehow how to push the wrong buttons. That pressure may be the reality of God exposing the fact that you may be mood-driven and not Messiah-driven. That your responses are typically based on how you feel and not the Spirit of God, and it shows. It shows when we are at our weakest point, who is really working. It shows when we are at our most vulnerable positions, who is really at work. It shows when we have exhausted every comfort that we can find on earth, who really is working in our hearts. This is the work of God where we can exercise patience under pressure, but once again, it is, it is making sure that your life fits the truth that you say you believe without ever, without ever forgetting that it is God who equips us to fit according to that truth. This bearing up, dear saints, could also be the pressure in our relationships. It could be a wife having to bear up with her husband, who is a professing believer, but there's some days he, he looks like the evil one. Or a husband having to bear up with his wife as he sacrificially offers himself up for her sanctification, knowing that he is in the process of her sanctification for the long haul. And he doesn't act out on his sinful impulses for her to change. And this is so dangerous. And I think it is a God complex in the lives of us as men. Where our wishes for the spouses, our wives change, has to do with what we prefer. And they know when we are not happy because instead of us praying for them, we become extremely sinfully twisted. Cold attitude, shortness of words, silence, the cold shoulder. I mean, aren't those all in the Bible? Yes, they're called sinful vices. But this is patience under pressure to answer Christ-like when you know whether it's being disrespected, dishonored, wrongly treated, that your response are still in line with the words of Christ. This, my dear saints, is fitting our lives according to the doctrine. Or maybe you're bearing up under the world's pressure. And even in the context of a local church, there will be professing believers who would rather you resemble the world and how you live and think than to zealously pursue Christ's likeness. That's patience under pressure. That's exercising patience toward difficult believers. And then you already know this, you, you will have to bear up under sin as if your own sins sometimes are not overwhelming enough. You have to bear up with the sins of others. Praying for them as you patiently let the Lord work on their heart. You know, it is very easy to be negative or to put down other believers who may make life challenging, but I love what Dr. D.A. Carson says, if you're going to Put anyone down, put them down on your prayer list. Pray for them. Oh, don't they need God? Aren't there acts of sins against exposing their greater need for God? This is patience under pressure. And sometimes you may have to exercise patience toward difficult believers by bearing up under a complaint or bearing up under false accusations. Do we not much rather have false accusations resolved quickly 
What if God is extending those false accusations? And let's be clear that if something is taking longer than you think it should, just remember that the sovereign one, it's not you, it's God. Every single detail of life is under his sovereign scrutiny. And if you have to bear up under that complaint or that false accusation longer, just know that it is producing in you godly perseverance or exposing the lack thereof. But what is so germane or important and vital to this bearing with one another is not to forget that humility is so critical. Whenever you and I think we deserve more than we have or things should be better than they are, that is one of the pinnacles of pride. It is arrogance to think that we deserve better when we know we all deserve hell. To have an accurate understanding of what we deserve is foundational to bearing up with each other, to bearing up on the difficult circumstances, to bear up on the complaints, to bear up on the accusations, and at some point you have to entrust it in the care of the Lord and let him resolve it in his time. But humility and gentleness with patience so critical in this process. And as we go deeper into the imperatives of proper, which probably starts unfolding or unloading on us in verse 25 of chapter 4, you will see that these virtues, although they're not exhaustive, they're indispensable. The humility and gentleness with patience, indispensable, critical, essential, a must-have to your life in Christ with fellow believers who are sinners just like you and I, saved by the grace of God. I'm going to turn your attention, though, to a, a passage in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. So you just turn with me a couple books, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, the third chapter. It is encouraging those who are now in Christ to no longer walk in the sin that characterized their life prior to Christ because it says in verse 2, you have died. You should set your mind on things above. You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So then you should put to death practically the things that you put to death by confession when you turn from your sin and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 13 it says, put on then as, and this is important dear saints, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as God has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. But you notice the conditions here in Colossians that your response of putting on compassionate hearts it's because God has chosen you. You're his set-apart ones. You're beloved by God. So we find also here that, that in divine election, where God has chosen to salvation, he's also chosen you to live this way. Compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. That this divine grace by God that chose you to salvation before the foundation of the world chose you to a, a set-apart life in visible and practical ways. I 
When you go back to our epistle in Ephesians chapter 4, it says that you should bear with one another in love. And we recognize in the third chapter that, that Paul prayed that they may grow to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Know it. Learn of it. Be overwhelmed by it because it is something that exceeds our knowledge of it. It is inexhaustible. And so when he says, bear with one another in love, I do pray that you recognize that as we preached and taught through this, this section in chapter 3, this intercessory prayer to know the love of Christ, how that plays into chapter 4 and how you can bear with one another. Not in some unholy, worldly tolerance or, you know, you have your corner in the room where you have this tirade or you, you know, if those of us who are married, we have our sections in the house where we can act out or we say, I'm going in the car for a drive. I'm just going to ride this steam off. I'm going to jog this steam off. I'm going to the local gym. I'm going to box this anger off. Those are all sinful vices. My dear saints, when you do this in love, it's none of those things. Those, those responses or reactions characterizes the unbelieving world. That's the way you should act when you're dead in sin. For those of us who've been awakened to the glory of Christ, His kindness to us, His meekness, His love, His affection, His care, His mercy, His patience, And you're bearing up in love, you're bearing up without complaining, without resentment or bitterness. This idea of doing so in love is to bear up with love or by love. So this is not a human agency. This is divine love. And this divine love strengthens you to respond sacrificially, voluntarily. It's not, yeah, I'll be better if you're better. No, I'm going to do what is right. It's not on the condition of your response. It's on the condition of the love of Christ. So you see how the conditions change now? The stipulations change. The stipulations are no longer what someone else does. It is what Christ has done for you. You do so voluntarily because Christ voluntarily offered himself up for you. You see how the stipulations are no longer about other people? It's about what Christ has done. So if the love here is the way to bear up, then the appeal is never for us to bear up using sinful compromises. It's not to have some far out psychological thoughts where you get psyched up for them. Where you tell yourself, 30 times you love them. No, it's a work of divine grace on the heart that never looks away at the cross. Because they know that they too have received what they did not deserve. Dear saints, how often do you look at the cross and just sang the great hymn? When you see what Christ has offered up for you, that is why this I, therefore, is so critical to unity and so many other things as we flesh out this life in Christ. Because you'll never fit the doctrine if the cross is never before you at all times. This patience, dear saints, is a holy patience. It is a holy bearing up with a holy humility and holy gentleness. You're not tolerating sin in your life or that in another believer, but you bear up with them with an eternal view in mind. But dear saints, I call you to set your thoughts there from the Lord Jesus Christ and his love for you. And then see how that love for you works in you. 
to exercise patience toward difficult believers or to exercise patience when you're pressured not to. To live with a priority to do what is best for each other. If you notice in the text of Scripture at the end of verse 2, bearing up with one another in love, and, and guess how the church builds itself up at the end of verse 16? It builds builds itself up in love. This requires patience. This requires patience toward difficult believers. I want to look at a, a second The second part of this application of patience and zeal for unity, and it is to zealously fight to preserve genuine unity. Zealously fight to preserve genuine unity. As we consider the body of instruction in verse 1, walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, and then in verse 3 is where we find this zeal, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And I take this last exhortation here uh, as the climax to the first three verses. But obviously the penultimate leading to the ultimate is in verses 4 through 6. But the high point for the saints In verses 1 through 3 is this eagerness, this zeal to fight, to preserve not just unity, but genuine unity. So we always have to have disclaimers because the way unity is promoted, say by the media and by even the masses in certain religious sectors, churches, we want to make it clear that genuine unity is not uniformity. It's not that we all wear the same colors every Sunday. This unity is bound not in an activity. That is secondary. Unity is bound in a person. True, genuine unity is bound in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then that unity that is in him grows according to the truth. Therefore, anyone who sets demands on unity based on cultural differences or social differences, that is counterfeit. Furthermore, we do not think the same, but we're called to have the same convictions about this person, Christ. Furthermore, we don't have the same giftedness or the same measure of gifts. Therefore, we cannot evaluate unity by having the sameness in quantity. If if God gives diverse gifts, and to some he gives ten, to others five, and another two, without question, we cannot have an equality of substance or earthly substance. That's not unity. We are truly united around this circumference, this core truth of Christ. And everything that is built is built around him. You look at verses 4 through 6, you recognize that unity is Trinitarian, not humanitarian. When our unity is humanitarian, it is based on personality, personal values, personal preferences, or a commitment to natural commodities. 
And if you read church history, the zeal for unity was and has been distorted by this type of sin and compromise. Either the compromise of wanting to be more lenient, past men in their zeal, and I don't think it's a godly zeal because a godly zeal does not oppose the Scripture. Some will say, well, they had good intentions, and we all know the classic phrase, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You must have God's intentions. Not good ones, but God's. Because there are some earthly good causes that have no eternal merit. In fact, there was one as such a preaching, very popular and accomplished some good things as, throughout his ministry, and that is Billy Graham. But at, at one point during the 50s and, and upwards, maybe to almost the turn of the century, he was almost the model for unity. Now, if the Lord saved you through his crusades or the preaching, all glory be to God. I am not saying your salvation is counterfeit. Because when the gospel is heard and the Spirit gives life, that's salvation. I'm just using this because he was seen as a very loving and a humble man. And maybe you don't really see me always as a loving man. You say, well, this preaching, it just seems to penetrate, and it, you, you almost sound like the grim reaper. So no, I'm, I'm, I'm the truth preacher. I'm not the grim reaper, I'm the truth preacher. And the Jesus, our Savior, the Lord says, it's the truth that will what? Not lies, not me trying to look like a nice guy. Because we can look like that. We all, most of us, if not all of us, want to be approved by men. And this is the horrific mistake that I believe that was made. It is an example of what it means to pursue unity outside of Scripture. And so he was a very gentle individual. But he set aside key doctrines to unite with other men for the gospel. It was Martin Luther who once wrote that softness and hardness are two main faults from which all mistakes of pastors come. And I cannot disagree with Luther here because we can really be soft and say we want unity, we want to compromise for unity. And for the sake of unity, we'll pursue and we'll set aside doctrine. Dear saints, to set aside doctrine is to set aside Jesus Christ. You no longer have him. He's no longer Savior. And listen, if you can set aside the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter where you are in life, I, I beg to differ if you're truly saved. It's impossible to set aside Christ who is your life, who is your all in all. Of course, there's a hardness where we can be so tired of a doctrine instead of using doctrine to fight against our indwelling sin, it becomes an arsenal of attack. And we attack those who disagree with us. Yet, dear saints, there is no excuse for the false balance we see today. Where we have a long list of respectable men who are really soft, just all loving. I mean, when you hug them, they just all fluffy and squeezy and so sweet and so kind to you. Oh, I love this preacher because he, he always encourages me. I mean, when you can have an unbelieving Jew says, I love his preaching, he's saying, I, I hate the Christ of Scripture, but I love this guy. If, you can, if an unbelieving Jew is not offended by the preaching, or an unbeliever is not offended by the preaching, unbeliever in general... But they love your preaching. That's a different Christ. My dear saints, you are not Billy Graham and neither am I. But whose unity are you pursuing? Because Scripture makes it abundantly clear that unity in Christ is in Him alone and it is fully Trinitarian. And that is what gives unity life and infuses in you a zeal for unity because you know it is a stewardship that comes from God. 
Genuine unity, therefore, it is divine, and it is imparted through divine agency, not human agency. Why is it that some professing believers have a zeal for this type of unity and others do not? It's because not every professing believer is truly a follower of Christ. The reason why is because this unity comes from the Spirit of God who magnifies Christ, who fulfills the will of Christ. And where you see a church where Christ is Savior and Lord, this Trinitarian unity lives and thrives within that fellowship. Dear saints, it is divine. And it is a gift given to the church through the work of the Holy Spirit who effectively brings this truth to light and life in your life. And then from there, this unity given to us by the Spirit is something we work out in our relationships. So what is your role in this zealous fight to preserve genuine unity, your role as a God-given responsibility is to pursue it. Don't chase after the fake stuff. There's only one genuine form of unity. That is believers being united together in salvation, having a common affection for the Lord, a common conviction about the authority of Scripture, the teachings from the Savior, and in unity, we have one goal for each other, and that is for my brother and sister to know Christ. So there is a responsibility in our part to maintain this unity. It's given to us. We don't create it. We don't amend it. There's no, there are no addendums to this. It is given to us. It is sealed by God. Our responsibility is to pursue it. So this pursuing of unity is not only something the pastor does, but it is brothers and sisters in Christ do it together. It is a husband and wife when they're both co-sharers of eternal life. This, this encompasses every relationship, even from a, a believing a father and mother to their children. It affects all of your life that this unity is centered in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is the duty of every believer to have this determination. Let me just say this, that unity in the home, where you have a believing husband and a believing light, wife, Unity in the home is a sign of Christ's lordship. Listen, if you're a renegade husband or a renegade wife, you're not running from your husband or your wife. You're running from the truth. You're running from God. Therefore, your profession is fake. It's counterfeit. It's a lie. You're not deceiving God. You're deceiving yourself. This unity, wherever it may be, in the local fellowship, in all of our relationships, is the byproduct of each person's submission to Christ. This is, this is not novel. This, this is not something we've not heard before. That's, that's it. And that is why we vet the church through preaching. The believers are judged through the preaching of the Word of God. When you're submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, unity becomes something so infectious that you want to model the unity that you find to be true in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What does this do? Genuine unity consumes your entire life. It brings everything and every relationship into the picture. 
It doesn't exclude any relationship between professing believers. This unity is woven into the very fabric of our lives together and our relationships. But then let's ask this question, how eager is this eagerness? Because maybe you think, well, you know, I, I can be somewhat eager. Yeah, I think I'm pretty eager. This is not a scale of, of 1 to 10. This is calling for total eagerness. But well, first of all, you will maintain unity or protect it. To protect it, it means to guard unity. This genuine unity, not coming up with your own, not fostering your own. In fact, the word when it was used literally described a, a guard or a, or a group of soldiers who would protect a king. Why is that so? Because the king is the nation's treasured leader. He is their treasured leader. And so the king, he's surrounded by guards, a legion of guards to help preserve his life. And that is the same mindset the Christians should have for unity. Protect it, guard it, watch over it. It's an honor to receive it. And the church must protect it from its enemies. And some enemies could be worldly philosophies, some we're seeing today. There, there is a contingency of men. And I'm only saying this as a warning to you, but also so that you can be discerning. We're also on the pulpit. They're demanding that churches make earthly or worldly compromises or concessions. And they said once that there will not be any unity between two ethnicities if the church does not exercise these prerogatives. And they were all secular. They were all worldly. That, dear saints, is counterfeit. It's not real. Whenever you make unity an earthly cause, it is no longer a heavenly cause. True Biblical unity is whatever advances the cause of Christ. And it is done through forgiveness, through acts of kindness, of mercy. You notice that to exercise true unity requires for us to implement and to do the works that the Holy Spirit is doing in us. It is nothing secular, worldly. It's not paying back. It's not reparation. It is repentance. It is not from sins done 400 years ago. It's sins we're committing against each other now. True unity is found essentially in the doctrine of the Godhead. And when men continue to advance it, they're not advancing God's cause, they're advancing Satan's cause. Ah, that, ah, that sounds harsh. Well, as far as I know, the Scripture teaches there are only two principalities at work. One is the power of God and the ruling authority of Satan, who is the prince and the power of this present system. And when you have conflicting arguments for unity, you have to know what true unity of the Spirit is. It is fake, it is counterfeit, when it does not meet the Scripture's demand. Christ, therefore, must be the cause and the condition for unity. He must be the cause. Why are we united? Because Christ has united me with him and given me fellowship with the Father. And the condition for unity would be the condition that he lays out in the Scripture. It is never something social. It is never something physical. It is always something supernatural. That is why Biblical unity is hard for the masses, but what a blessing for the few who pursue it God's way. Well, there are other oppositions to this unity that we must guard carefully and treasure it, my dear saints, because there, there is this, this ambition for us to disagree with the doctrine 
but let's agree on temporal conditions. One pastor said that there must be equal power before there's unity. Yeah, let me see. <laughs> Give me a second here. I'm gonna... Nowhere. Nowhere to be found in the scriptures. Absolutely absent. There needs to be no equality of power. That is also fake. It's counterfeit. This pastor said that Christian institutions must hire a diverse staff before there's unity. Well, wait a minute, I, I thought that was clear in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and, and Titus 1. Faithful men. Yes, men. To shepherd the congregation, to teach the word of God. That's counterfeit. You say, well, these men, they're really hurt and some things that's happened in the past. What? You may have intended for evil. God meant it for good. That is why the exhortation toward unity is based on Christ. Because no man has and will ever harm you as much as the harm you've done to Christ. And he still died for you. My dear saints, what humbles us to pursue this unity is that we come to recognize the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has achieved for us. We were former slaves of sin, rebellious, former drunks, thieves, liars, twisted, immoral, deceived, deceiving others. The text of Scripture says that we were once greedy, adulterous, cheats, such were some of us. But we heard the good news of Christ, His redemption, His forgiveness for us, for rebellious, hateful sinners. How we offended God in our sin and death, but yet God had mercy on us. Well, if that is true, my dear saints, are you not humbled by the gospel? Because it is the gospel that serves as a humbling sedative to the soul that keeps us united and pursuing unity. It's not the actions of men, the inactions of men. It is not the acts of hate done to us historically. It is what God has done for us ransoming us, redeeming us, justifying us through the Lord Jesus Christ. You do recall that humility is the ability, to, the ability to understand who you are and to understand who you are accurately. So when you protect unity, you do so as a sinner graciously saved by God and given this honor as a slave of Christ to pursue unity. There's another aspect that we need to consider in maintaining unity. Remember, dear saints, that you are not making unity, so don't make stuff up. Please don't do that. These men who are pursuing this, this modern vehicle of critical race theory and intersectionality and critical social justice and all of these mediums are making of unity. I must say this, that they are opposing Christ himself. Anytime a man cannot find mercy to give to others and grace and kindness and extend the olive branch and bring up with them patiently, he has no agenda that belongs to Christ at all. He's making up his own. Their saints don't assemble unity. No assembly required. And people say, well, the church has lost its unity. Unity is never lost. It's a precious gift embodied in someone you may have lost the affection for it, the love for it, but it is never lost, so you don't have to find it. As a church, unity is a gift given to us. We should not let it get away because of our pride and arrogance, our harshness, our bitterness, our individualism, our preferences, our earthly preferences. We cannot, because to do so is to oppose 
this divine agenda that God is fulfilling, that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, or as we learn in chapter 1 of Ephesians, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. My dear saints, that, that must be the impetus, the focus, that must be the motivation behind what we do. That must be the, the motor that drives our engine, is what God is doing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then you can despise unity. How? There are several ways you can despise unity. Because remember, this unity grows as we grow together, not grow, grow our separate ways. We hear that so common that that we, we just grew and went our separate ways. That, that's, that's a worldly philosophy. But the thing is, the, the more absent we are from the fellowship, the more absent we are from the believers, the, the more we disengage in serving each other. And naturally, what will happen is that we will live a detached life, and unity will never be as important to us as it should be. And consequently, because you're not connected to the life of the church and united in, in service and worship, you too will die of spiritually. And it will be proven that you were never a part of the true fellowship. This, this is so critical, this very life of the church. But I want to present one more to you quickly, dear saints, because at the very end of this, it says uh, to be eager, right? Diligent, retain unity, watch it closely, guard it, to do so with all eagerness, with almost a sense of make great haste to do this. Be active in doing this. Make every effort, exhaust all energy, take great pains, labor to the point of exhaustion. Well, how is this possible? Maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's it. So you never leave the theology. It's always there, and it is here throughout this text. Humility and gentleness, well, you know you don't have it. Patience, you don't have patience. Patience. Bearing with one another in love, these are all gifts that God gives us in salvation. So we never really leave the doctrine. And the same is true for the bond of peace. This, this is so vital, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, because this, this gives us a picture of what it means to be chained together like prisoners. So when the Apostle Paul talks about him being a prisoner for the Lord, I'm, I'm being chained to the ministry for my Savior. I'm a prisoner for Christ in chapter 3, verse 1 of chapter 3. That comes from the same root word. This bond comes from the same root word. This prisoner, that, that we, we are bound together in this peace. And so the unity of the Spirit is maintained. This hastiness for it, this pursuit of it, is maintained in the bond of peace. Well, where, does, where does this peace come from? Well, as Paul was bound to the gospel, bound to the local church, it had to do with the fact that he was bound to Christ. And now we're peace. You go back to chapter 2. We know that our peace comes from peace himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 14 of chapter 2, for he himself is our peace. That's it. What is a bond of peace? It is the peace that Christ gives to us. It is the peace that comes from Him. It is the peace that surpasses all understanding. It's the peace of knowing that we have been reconciled to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We recognize as we look at this that Christ has made both the Jews and the Gentiles one. This is the most severe hostility in the history of mankind since the fall. It is between these two ethnic groups consisting of the Jews and the rest of the world. If you think there's a hostility greater than this, then you are exceeding what is written. If you think there can be no peace because of what happened recently or several hundred years ago, then you don't know the Christ of peace. My dear saints, when he is your peace, you will pursue unity in this bond of peace, and it links us all together unconditionally. This is Trinitarian. This is how we can live and apply these disciplines that will encourage us toward genuine unity. This is how we zealously 
fight to preserve unity. It is, it is a bond of peace that has been given to us, united us, and it is through and from the Lord Jesus Christ. My dear saints, the challenge is not in apprehending this or knowing this intellectually. It's the application of the heart because of our sin. It's because of our presuppositions. It's because of our opinions, our thoughts. What gets in the way of living this out and pursuing this is our own heart cleaving to the world. Cleaving to the world's principles, the world's dogmas, the world's doctrines, the world's thoughts. This is where I'm encouraging you to let those thoughts die. Preserve this unity, God's way that has been given to you. Rejoice in it. Give God thanks for it. And then see it in our lives together. We will see it in our lives together. We will see it because we'll be peacemakers and not warmongers. We'll be peaceable, friendly, truthful, but loving. One of the best for each other. Because we want unity to be preserved with integrity and truth. So we've looked at this, dear saints, verses 2 and 3, applying humility and gentleness. That a spirit of humility recalls God's mercy. A spirit of gentleness accepts God's dealings. And then applying patience and a zeal for unity is to exercise patience toward difficult believers and zealously fight to preserve genuine unity. I have a few questions for you as we meditate and ask God's blessing upon our lives in this local church and churches all over the world to apply the word of God, to apply the person of Christ. But dear saints, are you ready to, to live in love and forgiveness with a zeal to maintain unity with others even if it may cost you? Are you ready to do so, to love, to live in love, to live, that is, in love and forgiveness with a zeal to maintain unity with others, even though it may cost you? Or do you believe that the doctrines are still unnecessary? Or do you believe that doctrines are essential to true unity? Not man's philosophy, but the pure word of God. Establishing the grounds for unity and how we remain united. And the greatest battle that you will fight with this is, is not just the world is within. The world is going to encourage you to pursue ungodly unity. That's the real fight. It's within your heart. Are you willing to submit to the word of God and have a, a godly passion for genuine, God-honoring, Christ-exalting unity? Pray with me. To our most gracious God, forgive us for giving the world access to our affections. Forgive us for not pursuing unity your way. Forgive us for the lack of of affection and passion for genuine unity. And maybe in our mind or even in our conversations with others, we, we may have made sinful compromises. We know you're merciful. We know that you're faithful to forgive us. I pray that we will confess those sins that you have brought to our attention. But now, Father in heaven, I pray that we will make a commitment, a renewed commitment depending on your Spirit's power, to live in a way that fits, that adorns the doctrine. That our life will day by day grow in its harmony with the truth. Sanctify us individually and corporately so that your divine intention and agenda before the foundation of the world which will always be fulfilled, will bear fruit in our lives so that we can say, yes, we gloriously rejoice that we stand as ambassadors for a great Savior and a most gracious Father. 
In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I ask these things. Amen.